Okay, I think we need to start with a song. Is that, is that okay? This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. <laughs> Sorry. What's shaking bacon? I'm Joni Simon. Welcome to my studio. This is where I do food photography. So if you're into that, you go ahead and hit the subscribe button. And today we're talking about artificial lights because I get lots of questions about what artificial lights should I buy? What artificial lights do you use? How does this all work? So what I'm going to do today is give you a general overview of the artificial lights that exist, what's out there, what's going to work for food photography, and then also have you ask yourself some questions so that you can understand what artificial light is going to be best for you. So if that sounds good to you, you stick around. So I absolutely love artificial light. If you've seen any of my work, any of the behind the scenes over on Instagram, you know that like I am an artificial light junkie because it gives me absolute control that I can shoot anytime, day or night, doesn't matter, doesn't matter what's going on outside, what the sunshine is doing. It also helps my workflow just in terms of creating consistency that the first image from a shoot and the last image from the shoot are exactly the same in terms of how the light is. So it makes my editing work flow a lot faster. And two, once I started shooting artificial, for some reason there was this part of my brain that just creatively kind of woke up because it enabled me to do things that I wasn't able to do and see things in sort of a different way. So for me, it added a whole new level of creativity. But I know there are plenty of people out there that say the only way to shoot food is with natural light. And so I just want to dispel that myth and say that, yes, I mean, natural light is fabulous and beautiful and there's so much character and creativity you can have there as well. But I also want you to know that artificial light by no means should be poo-pooed. I don't want you to think about those food images that you've seen with like the very clearly artificial light that just doesn't look good. That's not what we're trying to create here. So let's go through just what's out there, what exists, help put some names to faces in terms of the actual gear. And then from there, I'm gonna ask you some important questions. So now the big caveat though with this video is there is no such thing as the perfect light for every situation that as a photographer, no matter what situation you encounter, that you're not gonna have one light that will address all the needs perfectly of all those situations. Now, that being said, you can get some lights that will apply to like 90% of the work that you're doing, and then that small 10%, that's where your creativity comes into play, or that's where renting other gear comes into play. So hopefully I'm gonna help you understand what is the 90% for you and what's the best light for that 90% kind of work that you're doing. So in terms of artificial light, there are two different types, right? We've got continuous light sources, those light sources that are always on. So you're talking your LEDs, tungsten lights, fluorescence, that what you see is what you get, it's always on. And then the other being a flash-based lighting. And I think our first sort of interactions that we all have with flash are when you've got the little camera and the little, you know, thing, the flash pops up on the top of it and you let it go and, you know, it illuminates your scene. But for food photography, we don't want to be shooting with flash coming from the camera. It's just like the discussion we had in the natural lighting video about how you don't want to light your food from the front because that makes it feel really flat, that we want the light source coming in either from the side or from kind of the behind, that those sort of directions create three dimensionality for us in our food. It creates a really nice contrast of lights and shadows so that we feel like we can see that cupcake, reach out and grab it. And so flash and the kind of work that we're doing is we wanna take that flash off the camera. So you might have heard that term off camera flash. And the classification of all the different types of gear that are flash are called strobes. So whether that be a speed light, which is these nice little kind of portable devices, or you've got a mono light, which is kind of this all in one sort of setup, or you've got a studio strobe. And we'll get into more of the specifics of how those three are different from one another, but all three of those are flash. All three of those are considered strobes because they all produce this high intensity burst of light. And now if you've never worked with flash before and you're like, well, how does that all get set up? How does that work? Pretty much the idea is that you have your flash unit and that that has some sort of way to communicate with your camera. And whether that be some sort of wireless trigger or wired trigger, or you might've heard of pocket wizard there's all sorts of different ways that you can control it but more or less what happens is there is a communication device going from the camera 
to the flash that when you hit the shutter, then the flash goes off. So those are our two different light sources. That's flash and continuous. But then the thing that they all have in common is that they need to be modified. That you don't necessarily want to take a picture of your food with a bare light bulb or a bare flash. That we need to be able to modify that light. So sometimes that's just as simple as sticking some sort of diffuser between your light and your food in order to soften that light. But then there are also soft boxes, which is just kind of a general term for anything that is going over that light source and kind of containing it and directing it as well as diffusing it usually with some sort of diffusion material on the front. Now soft boxes can be round, they can be square, they can be rectangle, they can be a really long rectangle. There's a lot of different flavors and as far as modifiers go, but that is definitely a component of all artificial light. So as you can see, there are a lot of different options out there for artificial light, but now you might be wondering, well, what should I do? Well, then that's when you got to ask yourself some important questions. So so very first question is, are you going to be shooting video with this? And if that is the case and you are doing a lot of video work like I do, then a continuous light source is going to be very valuable for that because you can't shoot video with flash. It just, it doesn't work, right? We need a continuous light source continuing to light our scene. So if you are going to go with a continuous light source, there are two things that I'd say keep in mind and pay attention to as you're researching what you're going to buy. So the first thing is the CRI, so the color rendering index. And this more or less, I'm not going to get into all the techie jargon and science of it all, but the general idea is how well does that light bulb perform in terms of rendering our colors accurately and looking true to life that we don't have any color cast issues. Now this is separate from white balance, right? Because generally light bulbs will have some sort of like Kelvin. So as far as like we look at a low ego unit that's set at 5,000 Kelvin. So that's where it is on the temperature scale. But in addition to that, paying attention to that CRI number so that we know that, okay, yes, we want to set our Kelvin at 5,000 daylight balance. That's going to work great. But then we don't want to have some sort of like weird green or some sort of weird color cast issues that can pop up in light bulbs that are less than 90 on that CRI scale. So definitely look for something with a CRI of 90 plus, and that's gonna be good to go. And then the other thing to pay attention to, especially if you're gonna be doing video, and especially if you're looking at LED lights, is making sure that you're not going to have a flicker problem, that cheaper LED lights are known for flickering. And so you can see, for example, this is a high quality LED panel that I use to light my scene here, and it is continuous and it's smooth. We don't have any flicker issues. We have a high CRI. All of those things are great and fabulous. I will say I also spent an arm and a leg on this and saved up for like the better part of nine months to <laughs> afford that light. That being said, I absolutely love it, but there are plenty of LED light solutions out there there are some really cool innovations also going on in the LED space. Now, I by no means am an LED light expert. So what I would highly recommend if you are looking into LED lights, continuous lights in general, is checking out our Facebook group. Feel free to join. The link is down below and just ask general questions. There are a lot of really great experts in that group, different food photographers from all around the world with all sorts of experiences who I know are happy to weigh in on their thoughts about artificial lights. But then you can too also consult your various outlets like maybe your local photography shop or my favorite go-to is B&H. They're not sponsoring this or anything like that, but they are my favorite retailer for photography gear and they've got a great online chat just there on their homepage. If you just go there and say, hey, I'm looking to spend, you know, $700 on an LED light and I'm going to be using it in this kind of environment for these kinds of situations, uh, what would be your recommendation? And they'll definitely give you some options there as well. And then the other thing just to be mindful of in the world of continuous light sources, specifically for lower output lights, like the Lowell Ego, which is a pretty popular brand you'll see out there which I've done a whole video about that before, so you can go check that out over there. So you will need to shoot with them on a tripod because you're gonna have to utilize slower shutter speeds. If some of that is not making sense and you're like, why do you need slower shutter speed? Go check out my video all about operating your camera in manual. But in order to get a proper exposure, a bright enough image, with one of these lower powered units is that you need to have it on a tripod so you can utilize the slower shutter speeds so you can get a proper exposure without cranking your ISO. I mean, you can crank your ISO, but for food photography, 
less grain is generally more recommended because it's gonna make the food feel more true to life. Also for the lower powered units, you're not gonna be able to do those cool action shots because you can't get into those faster shutter speeds. You know, the one 200th of a second, it's just gonna be too dark of an exposure for that to work. But that being said, if you are down for shooting on a tripod, you don't need any action, you just need something simple and easy, then definitely a little ego is a way to go. And then of course, continuous lights are great because they apply for both video as well as still images. And just as a point of comparison, just to kind of show you the difference between shooting with the little ego and shooting with the Westcott Flex Mat, just a point by point comparison that see, you can create very very similar results. It's just a matter of understanding how does that light behave? What are the things you need to do? For example, the low ego, we're shooting at a slower shutter speed, but all still the same. You can create great images with either one, it just depends on the kind of work that you're trying to do. So the second question to ask yourself is, what is the environment you're typically shooting in? Are you shooting in a highly controlled space where you have the ability to shut off the overhead lights and close all the windows and have total control over that, like your own home space or your studio? Uh, or are you shooting on location, like at a restaurant, where gosh only knows what kind of crazy situation, crazy lights you might encounter? You know, for example, it was a couple weeks ago, I was shooting at a restaurant on location, and they stuck me right next to the bathroom. Super glamorous. There really wasn't any natural light to speak of anyway, so that wasn't an issue. I wasn't like, oh, can we shoot over there? So I got stuck in this one spot, kind of off into the back, so that I wouldn't interrupt service. But then there were these natural nasty canned lights overhead. They're casting some really dark, crazy shadows and creating some really weird colors also on the food. But that wasn't a problem at all because I was shooting with flash. And the magic of flash is that we have the ability to completely block out and override any sort of ambient light and solely use the exposure coming from our flash unit. So in essence, with flash photography, you have 100% total control over your lighting, which for me is a control freak is like music to my ears but it's not just applicable for like crazy unpredictable environments like a restaurant it also applies if you're shooting at home or in your studio for me here in my studio I have west facing windows all along the one side of the room and so in the afternoon when the sun is beaming through those even with the curtains drawn there is a certain amount of ambient light coming into the space and I've got all white walls and so that light is bouncing all over and so if I try to shoot images with a continuous light source with all that other ambient light going on, it just still doesn't define the shadows the way I want. It still feels a little flat and a little bit muddy. Whereas if I shoot it with flash and I knock out that ambient light, it just looks cleaner, it looks simpler, and the food really pops from my perspective. But one of the drawbacks with flash and how it's different from continuous light is that it does require a bit of extra education just in terms of like there is a learning curve to understand how to use flash and how we now deal with two exposures instead of just one. It's definitely some complex topics that take more than just a 20 minute YouTube video to explain. So that is why I created a special online course, a deep dive into flash for food photography specifically. It is 14 videos. It only only takes two hours to complete though. So it's not like super duper long, but it's long enough to definitely dig in, help you understand what are the tools, how do they work, how do we get a proper exposure, how do we knock out that ambient light, how do we make beautiful light for our food photography, and you can access that all today. It's linked down in the description box below. You can sign up and enroll. It's Flash for Food Photography. It comes with lifetime access to all of the video content plus the supplemental materials that I've provided, some different worksheets, and it also includes access to our private Facebook group only for people in the course where you can share your pictures, get images, input, feedback from me, ask questions when you run into struggles, say, Joni, what am I doing? And I'm happy to help you out as well as the other folks who are all currently enrolled in the course. So we would love to have you. All the details are linked down in the description box below. But now in the world of flash, then the question is, well, what kind of flash do I go with? Do I go with a speed light? Do I go with a studio strobe? What's going to be most helpful? 
helpful for me. So then it's a matter of asking yourself, well, do you want to be hauling a lot of gear on location? You know, for me, when I am shooting restaurants, I don't want a whole lot of gear. I want my camera bag along with some lenses, toss a speed light in there, and then another bag that has a light stand, a diffuser, maybe a softbox or an umbrella, depending, and then I go. I don't want a ton of extra stuff. Speed lights also run on AA batteries, so it's really easy that you can set up literally anywhere. You don't have to worry about are there outlets. Although you do always wanna make sure to have backup batteries in your bag just in case. And now at the risk of sounding like a speed light salesperson, which I apologize, but the other reason that I love speed lights is they are so affordable. That is a great option for anybody just getting started that for less than $200, you can get a great speed light along with a little mounting bracket, a light stand, a diffuser or an umbrella or softbox. You can get the whole kit and caboodle plus a little transmitter trigger thing. You get the whole thing for less than $200. And so to me, that is such an affordable solution that also provides you a great degree of flexibility that you can shoot freehand with it, that you can shoot those action shots, that you can take it anywhere, that you have a lot of flexibility for not a lot of money. And now just to show you, here's the speed light setup and taking an image with it. And then just as a fun point of comparison, I actually own two different kinds of speed lights. I have these inexpensive Young Nuo units, and then I also have a more expensive Canon unit, and here's the side-by-side -side comparison. So now for as wonderful and generally applicable and fabulous as speed lights are, there is certain work that then would require something like a mono light or a studio strobe instead. And that is generally gonna be the kind of commercial work where you're shooting at a really wide depth of field. So you think about how the camera works going back to shooting in manual and the idea of our aperture. That if we want everything a wide depth of field and focus, we need a smaller aperture that's gonna give us that wide depth of field. So something like F16. Well, what's that gonna do in terms of our exposure? It's gonna make it a lot darker. And so you can definitely get some really great power out of a speed light, but for those really, really wide depth of field, we're gonna need something even more powerful. And so then that's when you start looking at things like mono lights and studio strobes. Now, I generally don't do a lot of that kind of work, but I do shoot with a mono light here in my studio because there is an additional advantage with a mono light because it has a faster recycle time that from the time you throw the flash to the next flash you can throw, that it has a faster recycle time than a speed light does. So if you are looking to do things where you're getting a ton of fast bursts, like for example, I was doing some cheese pull shots with some pizzas the other day, and I wanted to get that as many frames as possible before the cheese expired and snapped, that having a unit with a fast recycle time was really, really helpful in that situation. I also like my mono light because it's got a nice battery pack on the back of it that I can charge up. I can take it outside. I can take it anywhere, but I'm also not going through double AP batteries like I am on the speed lights, which if you're going to go with speed lights, I highly, highly recommend rechargeable batteries. But now if you do any research in the world of mono lights and studio strobes, one of the things to pay attention to is the measurement of the watt seconds. So that has to do again with the output and the power of that unit. For me, I shoot a unit that's 600 watt seconds and I very rarely, if ever, shoot that thing at full power. So if you're gonna get into those kind of units, do pay attention to the watt seconds. And I've linked a really helpful article below that kind of gives you some baselines of understanding how many watt seconds you're gonna need for the kind of work that you're doing. And then just for fun, here is the setup of my mono light with the scene that we've seen here previously. And then here is the final image. And then the final question that I would have you ask yourself is realistically, what is your budget? Now, if you are just getting started, you are not making any money on photography yet, that you definitely should stick with what's free, which is the sun. And they're beautiful things. And you can create an amazing career being a natural light shooter. Food photography loves natural light. But if you are now getting paid and working as a photographer and you're kind of at that point where you're like, I'm just feeling limited and I need more flexibility 
I need more control, then you're gonna have a lot of fun with artificial light, but definitely be realistic about your budget and ask questions, ask around, look for other resources. By no means do you need to spend an arm and a leg because it's just like, you know, we did the Sigma versus Canon lens comparison and we do camera comparisons and we do comparisons on top of comparisons. And even here today, you know, we compare all these various lights, which are all at various budget price points and more or less the images on just cursory inspection look very similar, you know? Now definitely there are gonna be situations where absolutely if you wanna do like some of those intense splashes and crashes and wide depth of fields, like you're gonna need a light that's powerful enough and has the ability to capture those kind of images. But at the same time, if you're working with a budget, definitely don't feel ashamed to get some budget gear and get yourself started. Because as I always say, the gear is not as important as the eyeballs and the creativity and the knowledge that you bring to it. So I have yammered on long enough. And so what we're gonna do is next time, I'm gonna show you how I set up a scene with artificial light and get the kind of light that looks very natural, that does not look artificial and fake. So definitely subscribe, join me next time. And thanks so much for watching. I hope you have a fabulous week. You stay out of trouble and I'll see you soon, okay? Bye.